eighth grade, good to see you. Today, our spirit day is dance party. This morning, Ms. Ten and Ms. Reed arranged for all the collegiate leaders to enjoy um, the electric slide, which I had a lot of fun doing. Hope you had time to dance today or move around a little bit. It's really good for you. That's why my backdrop is dance. Yep, all about the dance today. So again, I hope you had some fun with it and enjoyed a little bit of that. I understand some of the uh, collegiate leaders had dance parties today, so good for you. We are continuing with the greatest treasure hunt in history. We are on page 100. 77, I want to make sure I'm right about that. Yes, page 177, chapter 13, gains and losses. And we're in C in Germany, the first week of April, 1945. And just before we start this chapter, as you recall, um, they now have what they consider the treasure map. The treasure map locating the art, uh, whether they're paintings or sculptures, that those, those pieces that were taken and that are now throughout Europe, uh, mainly in Germany. Walter Hancock and George Stout, accompanied by two American GIs and their guide, Father Stephanie, the guardian angel of the six boys in the Ashen Cathedral Fire Brigade, entered Segan's ghost-like ruins late on the afternoon of April 2nd to the sound of sporadic gunfire. The helmet of a GI caught Hancock's eye, as did the pool of blood nearby. Another horrible reminder that many men, like their friend and colleague Ronald Balfour, would never return home. Debris littered the streets, forcing them to continue by foot. Almost five months had passed since Hancock discovered a key clue when digging through dust-laden documents, a museum catalog with the name Segan written inside. Only now, with the Allied advance more than 100 miles inside Nazi Germany, were he and Stout able to reach Segan. The long, frustrating wait to locate their first art repository neared an end. First Army had taken Bonn and Cologne one month earlier, then swung north and west to link up with Ninth Army, capturing 300,000 prisoners and trapping the last effective enemy fighting force in northwestern Germany. Being in those German cities had provided Hancock with an opportunity to gather more information to determine the precise location of the Segan repository. A well-placed German source informed him that the, Super, the Surmont Museum treasures could be found in a copper mine inside a hill beneath the city's medieval quarter. But another piece of information proved even more surprising. Contrary to what he had been told by Father Stephanie months earlier, the Ashen Cathedral treasures and those of the cathedral in Cologne were also inside the mine. Father Stephanie, still embarrassed that he had been unwilling to trust Hancock with the truth, soon found one of the two entrances to the Segan repository teeming with people. Stout was convinced that he had just, he had seen just about everything possible since setting foot on Utah Beach nine months earlier. But even he had a difficult time processing all that his senses were experiencing. Around a hole in the steep hill stood some 20 people. They fell back and we went in. The tunnel, an old mine shaft, was about six feet wide and eight high, arched and rough. Once away from the light of the entrance, the passage was thick with vapor and our flashlights made only faint spots in the gloom. There were people inside. I thought we must soon pass them and that they were a few strugglers sheltered there for safety, but we did not pass them. 
it was a hard place to judge distance. We walked more than a quarter mile, probably less than a half mile through that passage. Other shafts branched from it. In places, it had been cut out to a width of about 20 feet. Throughout, we walked in a path not more than a foot and a half. The rest was compressed humanity. They stood, they sat on benches and on stones. They lay on cots, on stretchers. This was the population of the city, all that could not get away. At one time, the priest had to stop and speak to a woman who was ill. Many must have been ill. There was a stench in the humid air. Babies cried fretfully. We were the first Americans they had ever seen. They had no doubt been told that we were savages. The pale, grimy faces caught in our flashlights were full of fear and hate. Children were snatched out of our path, and ahead of us went the fearful word, halfway between sound and whisper, Americana. That was a strange part of the occurrence, the impact of hate and fear in hundreds of hearts close about us, and we the targets of it all. Hancock felt it too. He heard awed whispers as they walked deeper into the mine. In front of them, mothers call for their children in fear. The vicar, sensing the two men's discomfort, said, they are afraid that you will kill the children. To think that was one thing, but to hear someone confirm it out loud saddened both men, especially Stout, father of two boys. Seeking to put his statement in context, the vicar added, the radio threatened that recently, anything to keep them fighting. There was some indifference though. Stout noticed a boy about 10 years old blowing on a cup, trying to cool its contents. There was something else in the fetid air, something Stout could only sense, until he felt a touch of his hand. Shining his flashlight, he saw a boy about seven years old. The boy looked up and smiled, took Stout's hand and began walking. I shouldn't let him do this, Stout thought, yet he didn't pull his hand away. He didn't feel any sense of regret. The experience stuck with Stout. Later, he wondered why the boy was so trusting. With the horror of war that the seven-year-old had experienced in his town and the propaganda that he had undoubtedly heard, Stout would always wonder how the boy sensed that he was not a monster. After walking more than a quarter of a mile into the hill, Father Stephanie reached a locked door and knocked. A short but muscular man, Herr Etzkorn, the guardian, opened the door and greeted the vicar by name. The guardian's demeanor changed quickly at the sight of four American soldiers standing behind him. After passing through several more, several more doors, the group reached a hollowed out chamber more than 30 feet long, containing wooden racks filled with paintings and sculpture rising to the ceiling. It didn't require a detailed inspection for Stout and Hancock to realize that they had found what they were looking for and more. Paintings by Rembrandt, Fragonard, Van Gogh, Gauguin, Cezanne, and Kranich filled the chamber. Even works painted by Segan's favorite son, the prolific Flemish artist Peter Paul Rubens were there. In all, over 400 paintings were jammed into 14 wooden bays constructed inside the old mine shaft. The two monuments men quickly determined that the Segan Repository didn't house just the auction museum collection, but also those of Bonn, Cologne, Essen, and several other Rhineland, Rhineland cities. Of greatest interest to Father Stephanie were the auction cathedral treasures, safe inside their heavy cases, wax seals untouched. 
As Hancock and Stout turned to leave, Air Etzcorn pointed to a stack of crates, 40 in all, and said they belonged to the Beethoven House in Bonn, birthplace of the genius composer and pianist. One of the crates contained the manuscript of his famous Sixth Symphony. Nearby were two ornately carved 11th century oak doors removed from Cologne St. Maria M. Capital, a Romanesque church that had suffered gravely from the continual bombing of the city. The artist in Hancock admired the craftsmanship of the unknown sculptor who used his carving chisels and knives to make scenes from the life and death of Christ come alive. Stout lamented the storage conditions. The heating system was not operational and as a consequence, the air was filled with moisture made worse by dripping water from the ceiling. Some canvas paintings had mold damage, wood panels had flaking paint, but all in all, Stout believed that the repository was the safest place for the objects until arrangements could be made to move them to a better storage facility. The number of German cities falling to Allied forces increased each day. In the north, the British were bearing down on Hanover. Patton and his Third Army were leading the charge into the heart of Nazi Germany at an ever-increasing pace. To the east, the Soviets had amassed 2.5 million troops outside Berlin, poised for the final shutdown. With more conquered territory, though, came more requests for inspections by the monuments men. Stout and Hancock were needed elsewhere. For now, all they could do was post guards at the Siegen copper mine until they could return. No one had any idea when that might be. Some wonderful photographs here um, from their finds in that mine where all those people are hiding for safety. We'll begin next time on page 183. Thank you, eighth graders. Take care of yourselves. Bye now.